Bristol Sycamore was the first British designed helicopter. The prototype flew in 1947 and 178 were eventually built. The crews that subsequently operated them around the world helped pioneer many of the air sea rescue and troop transport techniques commonly used today. A beautifully restored Mark III version can still be seen at the Helicopter Museum in Western Supermare. Uh, they, they certainly have done a bloody good job of this. Tail skin, invaluable. It, 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 it's, it's pity, pity I, I'd like to fly it again, but <laughs> I, don't, I don't think they'd let me. Former chief test pilot Sox Hosegood first learned to fly helicopters during the war in 1944. His friend and colleague Peter Wilson learned to fly them in 47 and was originally an army test pilot before joining Sox at the Bristol Aeroplane Company. I don't know if I can get in now. Quite a business, you know. I haven't been in the thing since, I haven't sat in it since 63. It's a long time. A bit more active then. Yeah, well, I'm. I'm... I but, can't remember the last time I flew in this, to be quite well, honest. Well, I think it was probably, probably since, since then. But um, I think I first flew this in about 51 when it made its first flight. But many happy memories. Quite, quite quick for a helicopter in those days. Oh, yeah. 100 miles an hour. No, 100 knots. Yeah. That's, that's about 125 miles an hour I could fly at. Um, and best part of 300 miles it could carry without refueling. Yeah. Uh, we've been quite useful today. This particular helicopter was one of the early marks. We went up to 14 different marks, uh, basically the same, but with improvements and modifications. This was one of the early ones, and it became the Bristol Aircraft Company's demonstration aircraft. And as at that time I was the chief helicopter test pilot, it, it fell to me to do a lot of demonstration flying um, and, and, and instruction and familiarization uh, in this very aircraft. It was uh, our flagship for the helicopters. And the great thing about it was that, um, well, sometimes it was a bit off color, but it never failed. I've never had an engine failure in it or what I would call a, a major mishap. <laughs> Well, when I first flew the Sycamore, it, it was um, a prototype of this, and it had a, a, an American engine in it, because the uh, Alvis engine, which this has, was not then available. And the two first prototypes had American engines, uh, so they were rather different to this. But I had been flying a, a Sikorsky R4 before that, and the difference, the, the extreme power that I had in this, which of course is minimal now by, by today's standards, but at that time it was uh, quite an eye-opener. And suddenly I found I was in an aircraft that could really do something. <laughs> the chief helicopter designer at Bristol was the renowned Austrian-born engineer Raoul Hafner, who'd been working on helicopter designs as far back as the 1920s. Oh, he, he was a delightful man, a wonderful, wonderful person uh, to, to um, know socially and, and, and to work with. Well, he was simply a very clever engineer and a great math mathematician. Alpha Naprees, helicopter pilot and editor of Helicopter International magazine, is chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Helicopter Museum, which over the years has built up a remarkable collection. All these early helicopters were powered by modifications of ordinary aeroplane engines, the, the type that you would find in a fixed-wing trainer, for example. What they did was they turned the engine through 90 degrees, um, so that instead of driving a propeller forward, it was actually driving a vertical shaft. Now, in order for it to be cool, you then had to have a fan to cool the engine, and the engine's actually under here, this radial piston engine. Um, this was a big drawback for a lot of the early helicopters because of the weight and also that you really had quite a limited amount of horsepower. Later, when they started adapting the jet engine as the turboshaft engine, it absolutely revolutionised it because you then went to a much smaller engine providing perhaps twice as much power that you could actually fit on top of the aircraft. And that did two things. It, it gave the helicopter far more power it also released more space inside the helicopter to carry people or freight. 
there are two other features on the sycamore which are really worth mentioning, which were revolutionary. The first was what we call the spider rotor head, because Raoul Hafner designed a head where a lot of the controls were down inside, and that made for a very smooth and streamlined rotor head compared to a lot of other helicopters of that period, and of course streamlined meant speed and performance. The other feature was the rotor blades, which are actually made of wood. And they're made exactly in the fashion of a, a wooden wing. In other words, they have ribs and spars inside them, and then they're covered with um, ply. And this was actually uh, a method that originated during the Second World War, building the bomb bays for the Bristol Beaufort. But the advantage of using wood in this way was that you could actually get very aerodynamic shapes. And I think you can see that the blade is really quite a beautiful thing. Um, and it's said that even in modern day times, you know, the blades on the sycamore are extremely effective, um, much more so than all the metal blades that have been built since then. And it's only now that we're beginning to return to using composites, that they're beginning to get back to that type of aerodynamic shape, which again gives the aircraft exemplary performance. The tour also provided opportunities to demonstrate the aircraft's unique ability as a rescue vehicle. And there were spectacular life-saving demonstrations over the Swiss lakes. After controls was Bristol test pilot Captain Peter Wilson, who has logged hundreds of hours of helicopter flying in all parts of the world. Well, the first time I saw Sycamore was when Sox brought it down to Bewley from Bristol uh, for us to test. And it was such a lovely looking machine compared with the American helicopters which we had, which are much smaller, our fours and our sixes. Dragonfly, built by Westerners, was much bigger, but this was a much more modern aircraft, and it was sophisticated, smooth, nice to fly. The Mar 14 was a military aircraft. It was the last one made of the, all the Sycamores in terms of marks, and I think this one may originally have been a stretcher carrier and it has a, a different throttle system in as much as it only has one collective lever in the center between the two pilots, but it has a transverse throttle, which both pilots could have their hands on. Pilot on the right would have his left hand on it, pilot on the left would have his right hand on it. The only flying example in the world is to be found at the Flieger Museum in Altenheim, Switzerland. It was one of a batch of 50 delivered to West Germany between 1957 and 1959 and served with the West German military until 1976. It's now owned and flown by Peter Schmidt. And as Peter will tell you, being a bit of an old-timer himself, he feels perfectly suited to this magnificent 50-year-old helicopter. Peter's fascination with the Sycamore started with acquiring engines and grew from there. He was granted permission to use this Royal Air Force livery on the understanding that the helicopter is kept in immaculate condition. Despite his love of flying, the technical aspects of the aircraft still hold great appeal. At present, he's the only person in the world allowed to fly it, but such is the reliability and robust nature of the Sycamore that Peter is sure it will be flying long after he retires, and with that in mind, he's keen to train others to take over. He also has plans to make another two or possibly three Sycamores airworthy. One of the intended aircraft is this example. It was once operated in Germany in a firefighting role, and it was one of the marks of Sycamore fitted with a side winch, which in this case is still in working order. The Bristol Aeroplane Company went on to develop another remarkable helicopter, the revolutionary twin-engine Belvedere, but in 1960, the company was taken over by Westland, bringing to an end 50 years of aircraft production. Yeah.